whenever you are. My name is Nicole Hancock and I'm the dietitian here at Lyft. I do all of outpatient services actually for the hospital now. So anytime you have a doctor that does a referral or anything like that, I'm actually the person who that gets referred to in terms of nutrition. So tonight we're gonna talk about spice up your taste buds. Um, oftentimes we have salts is such a huge part of our meals that we, and most people will come and tell me that, well, I just don't know what to use. I don't know what to do. I haven't done much with it. Where do I start? Where do I go from? It's not that, salt is their only option they just quite aren't sure and spices can be expensive i think the highest one that i've seen is like eight dollars you know for a like a small jar <laughs> that's not even the big ones that you can get and so getting spending eight dollars on a jar that you use one time necessarily isn't the most cost friendly way of you know trying a spice so we're going to talk about some different ones um, but we're also going to talk about how the fda and cdc actually regulate some of the spices for you so you kind of have an idea and they actually do this with some of the other foods as well too and then we'll get into a few different spices and kind of tell you what you can use them for how's the best way and kind of what some of the benefits of them are as well too so the first thing we're gonna talk about is irritation. There's actually three ways to irritate your food, and they do this, there's only certain foods that actually are approved for irritation, and most of your spices are approved for that as well too. So one of them's gamma rays, and basically what happens is exposing, it's radiation that goes through the food, but it's just a slight radiation that goes into it. It's not, it doesn't give off neutrons, therefore it's not radioactive, so we aren't gonna have kryptonite at the end of this, or glowing food by any means. But the whole point of it is to eliminate um, germs or disease causing agents that could potentially be on the food and gamma rays are actually specifically for thick food so we're talking like an inch or more they're going to be utilized for that electron beams they are a stream of high energy electrons and it can be turned on or turned off without using radiation so this one doesn't have to but because they don't use radiation you can only penetrate three centimeters into a particular food item so it's only for very thin foods then your x-ray is similar but a lot more powerful than like an x-ray machine at a hospital or an x-ray machine in a dentist's office as well too. And again, the x-ray is actually one that can penetrate thick foods as well too. So anything, you know, an inch or more, anything over those three centimeters times, then we're gonna have to go to either a gamma ray or an x-ray type. Um, aspect for that. And typically your rays are measured in gray units. So they'll say, well, we've had to use so many gray units to get to this particular point in time. And it's different for each food item. And a lot of it depends on, for a lack of a better term, how dirty the food is at the time that they're having to do that. Because the dirtier the food, then the higher amount of radiation that they're gonna have to use for that particular food item. So using one of those previous methods, basically what you're doing is you're slightly heating up the food. You want that slight burst of energy to go through and you're basically killing any living cells that's in it at the time. So an example would be like a potato. If it's not irritated, potatoes start sprouting over a period of time if you just have them sitting in a pantry or in a shelf. If they don't start sprouting, then typically you're probably gonna have known that those were irritated because that's that slight heating mechanism to kill those cells so that it can't sprout. And the whole point is to improve the shelf life because if it can't can't grow anymore it's not going to grow mold it's not going to go bad so that's what some of those reasonings are behind that as well too and this is your international symbol. It's called a radura, and this is one that they typically use. So like if you go to China or you go to Europe or whatever, if you see this symbol, then that way you know, oh, that food has been irritated in some way, shape, or form. It's not going to tell you which method that they use, but it's at least gonna tell you that yes, my food has been irritated at that moment in time. And the FDA made this particular symbol just so that we knew no matter what language you're in, you know that, okay, something's happened to my food. And like I said, they've approved a variety in the United States. And I'll be honest, I've looked at all the stores here to see if I can find the symbol and I've yet to find it. But I also still wonder, are they doing it and it's on the boxes, not on the actual food labels in the store? And I really can't give you that answer. So if you find it, I need an email that says, hey, go to this store. <laughs> I found it on this food item. So that way I know, because I'm really curious, because usually it's like beef, pork, poultry, shellfish, um, shell eggs, 
eggs, fresh fruits and vegetables, lettuce and spinach, spices and seasonings, and then seeds for sprouting. Now they don't have to put it, like if you have a combination food and they've used a spice or an ingredient that has been irritated, they aren't required to put the symbol. But if they've irritated the entire food item, then they are supposed to have the symbol somewhere. Well, usually, you know, fruits and vegetables, you buy them individually. So my question would be, are they on the boxes to let them know? And I don't know that they would put that information inside the store unless the store was regulated to do that. So, but if you do see that symbol, that's kind of what that means. So the question is, is irritation good or bad? Well, the CDC states the more initial contamination there is, the higher dose of irritation it would take to eliminate possible pathogens and the greater the change in the taste and the quality of food. So just like we were talking about earlier, kind of the dirtier the food, the more irritation you're gonna have to have to actually make sure you eliminate all those pathogens. Those higher levels is whenever you start looking at the quality of that food changing. The lower levels, they're stating that no, that shouldn't actually adjust the food any. You should be able to have it just like normal, same nutritional quality at that point in time. So we're gonna look at a couple of journal articles and these are basically just to give you an idea of what radiation has done to some specific food items and kind of what they're looking at. So the International Journal of Molecular Sciences, they posted um, a research article based off of soybeans. What happened if we irritate soybeans and what changes is that going to make? Well, some statements from that particular publication Higher doses of radiation could have adverse effects on sensorial and nutritional quality. So, and that was kind of towards the beginning of the article, just stating in general that it can affect the food. The question is at what point is too much and at what point does that food start being affected? And it's kind of been different in each of these research articles, so that's why I pulled a, a few of them. Um, this one particularly used gamma irradiation, and they were saying that it caused oxidative stress and affects biomolecules by causing conformational changes and basically the formation of free radicals. We all know oxidative stress or any time you have an oxidative reaction in the body, free radicals start forming. Well, free radicals are that cancer-causing agent that we want to get out of our body. And so that is one area that it can cause a problem. Um, their conclusion actually at the end of this was that gamma irradiation increased antioxidant capacity and antioxidants are ones that fight these free radicals, which is why we push fruits and vegetables and they're so high in antioxidants for that reason. Um, and protein stability of the actual soybean seeds. So in this particular study, it actually improved the situation because of their dose of radiation that they were providing them with. Um, so overall in this one, soybean seeds were actually improved with the radiation instead of um, dec decreasing the nutritional quality of that particular food item. Now this next one, it was actually looking at vitamin E. Now there's eight, vitamin E, there's eight kinds of vitamin E. There's actually four tocopherols and, fo and four tocophenols. So there are different types. And what they did in this particular study is they took um, two to three of those and they research to see how is it going to affect each one. And at the end of it, they found that it affected one in particular of those eight. And to tell which of those eight you're getting out of which individual food, they don't put that on a food label. You're just gonna see, hey, it's got some vitamin E in it. So they went a little specific on this one, but basically what they came to at the end was that a combination of irritation and other methods of treatments can be very destructive to the food. So they're saying, I have an irritated food and I've decided I'm going to cook it in some way, shape, or form. I'm gonna put it in the microwave, I'm gonna put it in a slow cooker, a skillet, an oven, a grill, whatever ch you choose. And that extra heat capacity is actually what starts to harm the food. So if it's like a fruit or a vegetable and eating it raw, it just shows that that would actually be the best method to eat it rather than cooking it more if it has been irritated. Now, if it's not been irritated, then it's not necessarily gonna change it um, depending on which cooking you're actually choosing, whether it's steaming, boiling, baking, whatever those options are that you're particularly using. But in terms of irritation, both of them together is becoming the most destructive form is what we're seeing in this particular article. So a couple of statements, like, we, like I said earlier, FDA and CDC both regulate this and they do this specifically for any time, especially because we know a lot of our food is imported. So they want to make sure, is it clean, is it safe, is it something that we can utilize? So FDA stated that irritation does not make foods radioactive, which is good, we want that. <laughs> Compromise nutritional quality or noticeably change the taste, texture, or appearance of the food. 
And in fact, the changes are so minimal that they actually, they can't even tell the difference, has the food been irritated or not irritated, if they're using low levels. If they're using high levels, then that's gonna be different. They are gonna see some of those nutritional quality changes at that time. Now the CDC, uh, these studies showed clearly that when irritation is used as approved on foods, disease-causing germs are reduced or eliminated. The food does not become radioactive and dangerous substances do not appear in the foods and the nutritional value is essentially unchanged. Again, in those particular um, degrees of irritation that they're doing. Anytime we go past what those approved ones are, that's when we start running into a lot of problems with this particular one. So what do we recommend? We actually recommend non-irritated organic spices, or if you can't find non-irritated, just organic spices as well too. Just in general, we know that it's less chemicals that are gonna be on there. And because the hope is that even if it's an organic, if it's an organic substance, then we already know well, we haven't treated it with anything that could possibly be a germ causing or a disease causing state. And then non-irritated, that's just extra radioactivity of radiation that we don't need on that particular food item if it's clean to start out with. So those are things that we really push for in that. And you're going to see, like you can see on this one where it says all natural salt free and it says non-irritated. They don't hide it, they don't put it so small that you can't find it it's going to be right there on the front of it. I've bought them before and it's right there on the front of the spice. So they're not trying to hide it or make it hard for you to find on that one. So whenever you're looking at herbs, the biggest thing that I usually get asked a question is, what do you buy when? Well, herbs are very much like fruits and vegetables. You buy what's in season. And I've got this handout for you and I'll make some copies of it at the end so that you can take it home. But as you can see, you know, different ones, buying it in season, number one, especially if you're buying it fresh, is gonna be much, much cheaper. So I always recommend, you know, go and try anything that's in season because at least you're going to have that availability to taste it. And if you hate it, you know what? You didn't spend very much money on it. So I'd rather you do that than go spend $8 on something, hate it, and then find out, well, what am I going to do? I just wasted $8. Okay. So those are some different options, but you'll get this to be able to take home with you to kind of see, well, what are my options in this area and what should I be looking for at this particular time, especially with the farmer's market. So let's go over a few of these. Um, I just picked some that some people have mentioned, oh, I don't really know what to do with, or just some that are some good um, variances. So dill, potential benefits, relieves nausea and aids in digestion. And again, nutritional value, any green leafy substance is always gonna have some potassium in it. So if you are currently having to watch your potassium, whether it's a kidney disease you're having to deal with, or if you just got too high of potassium at this moment in time, do be careful because just because it is a seasoning or a spice doesn't mean that it still doesn't have nutritional value to it. It's not just meant for flavoring. So do make sure that you're aware of that, especially if you're on a very strict diet of trying to eliminate something out and be very careful with which ones you're doing. So this one, potassium and sodium are ones, and the potassium is the highest in this one, and most of these you're going to see because a lot of them are, are green leafy ones, potassium is the highest, and they're usually like 100 milligrams or above of potassium for them. Great, um, it has a feathery texture, very sharp taste if you haven't tasted it. Great on fish, chicken, potato salad, pickling, different things like that are some really good ways to use it. Bay leaf, this one's actually a natural pain reliever. And any of these that are some of these natural um, effects that you can have, you can always crush them up and put them in teas and drink the teas to get some of those benefit as well too. And that heat will help start bringing out some of that flavor as well for you. Uh, again, it's a green leafy substance, so potassium is gonna be a higher one. And this one actually, even though it is a green leafy, it's only 10 milligrams of potassium in this particular one. Tastes a little woody, but it's perfect um, in soups, sauces, stews, pot roasts. And I don't know if you've ever used it. I've used it um, multiple times in stews specifically, especially like crock pots. And you just put like one to two leaves in and you stir it up and you let it soak in there, but you don't actually eat the bay leaf itself. You actually end up taking it out at the end of cooking. So you'll get the flavor out of it, but you actually aren't gonna eat the, the spice itself unless you're grinding it up and you're wanting to leave it in there. But if it's just the leaf, and trust me, it gives tons of flavor in there. So it's not like, oh, I need to crush it up because I'm gonna lose the flavor if I don't. You actually don't. I got to the point where one of mine, I left it in too long and it was a little much. <laughs> so do make sure that you keep an eye on that and don't just leave it in there for forever and think, oh, this is gonna be great because it might be a bit overpowering for you. 
Rosemary is another good one that I think a lot of people kind of overlook. They just aren't sure, well, what do you do with rosemary? I've had actually people tell me that it seems like a perfume. And why do I want perfume in my food? Well, it's not, um, but it does help with reducing headaches and migraines. Um, stimulates digestion and relieves flatulence and again this is one that would be great to use in teas and also um, I don't know if you guys have ever used like essential oils but the rosemary essential oil is great just to like rub on your temples to try and help relieve some of those headaches as well too so rosemary can be used for a lot of beneficial things and you could probably even put some in like a little bit of coconut oil and rub them on as well too to try and help a little bit of that again it's a green leafy so potassium is going to be a higher amount in this one culinary uses it has a kind of a piney flavor and I'll be honest I don't taste it as strong like whenever I mix it with something else so if it is too strong with you my husband and I we love doing rosemary and garlic and we do it on a lot of our vegetables so that's a good combination for us to get that flavoring between the two but grilled meats um, it does give kind of an interesting boost to different desserts if you want to try that just to have a little bit different taste to it lamb uh, soup and stews are some other options for you as well I put cinnamon on here because mostly people know a lot about cinnamon and it's one that people know that can be very beneficial for you. It does help relieve upset stomach and there is some research to suggest helping with cholesterol levels and diabetes. Now I will tell you with the diabetes aspect, the American Diabetes Association, their claim right now is they actually do not promote it for blood sugar regulation because even though there is research to suggest that it can be very beneficial, it's still um, unwavering and it's not one 100%. They can't get a really good grip on, yes, this is going to be beneficial consistently. So because of that, they're very cautious about saying, absolutely, take this for your blood sugar regulation. I will tell you, I've not had any of my patients that are diabetic have it hurt them in any way, shape, or form. So even if it's not one that's, oh, it's doing such a great job on your blood sugar, it's still something that you can season with and utilize. And if it does help, great. If it doesn't, it's not necessarily going to harm you either. Um, but basically the great thing about cinnamon, you can use it on anything. Sweet, savory, I mean, you can really use it to, to just give a different flavor for pretty much any food item that you want. This is probably one of my staple food items that I have is cinnamon. I love it on anything and everything. Kind of grosses my husband out sometimes, but I love it on anything and everything. So, And some potassium is actually in this particular one as well too. Paprika is another good one, um, effective against cold system, si symptoms. We do know that um, a lot, anything that's got that kind of spicy, strong uh, flavor or smell to it is gonna naturally open up those sinuses because as they inflame and they start to close off and you have problems breathing, that spicy flavor or that spicy smell specifically can really relax some of that and kind of help open that up as well to you. So it's always very good. Put it in hot water. Um, I'm not a real spicy kind of person on hot spices. So if you aren't on that, you might not necessarily want to drink it, but it really wouldn't even be bad just to smell it. Just like kind of with onions, it can kind of help open up as well too. Vitamin C, vitamin A, and potassium, these are all great resources for this particular food item. Great in soups, vegetables, chicken, fish, and beef, really anything that you just want to add just that really like little kick to at the end, this is a great one that you can utilize for that. So let's talk about fresh versus dried. In a lot of my grocery store tours, this is kind of one of my big questions because people don't know what to get. Do I get fresh? Do I get dry? Do I get powder? What is the difference? What's the potency difference? How are they going to last? What am I going to do with them? If I've got all, because you know whenever you go to buy fresh, can you just buy a leaf of something? No. <laughs> You're coming home with this big bushel of like um, a seasoning that you want to use one time and you need a, like a teaspoon of it and then you got this whole bushel and then what do I do with it? So we'll talk about some of those aspects, but fresh versus dried, potency wise, dry is actually your most potent. Fresh is your second and powder is your last one. So to give you an idea of how the potency difference is, if a recipe calls for a tablespoon of fresh, you actually only use a teaspoon of dry because it's a third ratio and there's three teaspoons in a tablespoon. So it is a lot more potent. However, dry, unless you store it correctly, you lose the potency very, very quickly. 
So we'll talk about that. So for fresh cut herbs, the best way to do it, wrap it in a paper towel and put it in a resealable plastic bag and then put it in the refrigerator. But dried herbs, you actually wanna keep it out of the light as much as possible. You still want it in a cool place though. So it wouldn't be a bad idea to have it like down in the crisper on the bottom where it's not near the light quite as often, okay? Now, if you start to notice you um, have it in a bag of some sort and you open it up and you just don't really smell a whole lot, then you're losing your potency and you have I'd probably just throw it out because the likelihood of it really flavoring your foods the way you're hoping it will is probably slim to none. Uh, another tip with seasoning as well too is that adding your seasonings in during the last hour of cooking is going to give you the most flavor in that particular food. So if you're putting a crock pot on or you're doing a stew or you're doing like green beans and you're cooking them all day or even for several hours at a time, I would highly recommend whatever seasoning you're putting in, wait till that last hour. Let the food cook and then go season it because you're going to have the best flavor because after so long you are going to cook, start cooking cooking the flavor out because it's been in there so long. It's just the same aspect as if you slightly burn food, all of a sudden it all tastes burnt because it took on that flavor. When do we usually burn food? The last hour of cooking or so is whenever you're going to do that. So those are some different options to try and help you have just a little bit more flavor. And another way for storing uh, especially your fresh vegetables. I've got another handout for you guys that I'll make a copy of and give you. But especially with the farmer's market, you know, you can, the farmer's market is open probably through October, maybe beginning of November, and they have different things all year round. So at that time, whenever you know, well, I wanna go buy some fresh herbs, how do I get them to last over the winter? You can actually put them in ice cube trays with water and freeze them. And then after they're frozen, put them out, put them in a bag, and then label. I've got rosemary, or I've got garlic, or I've got basil or cilantro or whatever you're getting. And then most recipes, whenever you're gonna season them anyways, they call for water, or they call for a liquid of some sort. So putting those ice cubes in to melt it and then get that flavoring in there is not gonna harm the food at all, but that's gonna allow you to have those fresh herbs and be from the garden, even though it's in the middle of winter, okay? So those are some good options for you. So I'll make sure you guys get that handout at the end as well too. So where do you buy them? That's the other question. There's two places, Simply Organic, which is an online company. You can buy any of the spices that are non-irritated organic spices through them. The other aspect here in Jackson is actually maple leaf. Maple leaf is fantastic if you haven't been there. They're one that if you need something and you can't find it, but I don't wanna go to Memphis, I don't wanna go to Nashville, I don't have time. They're one you can go and say, hey, can you find this for me? I'm really needing to get it and they'll order it for you. And you can get it right there, which is wonderful. So they're very, very good about that. None of the other stores in Jackson for health food wise have I been able to find that are willing to do that. We've got, I think about four that I've seen. I mean, we've got Vitamin Shop, which they're just a commercial one. So they aren't gonna order specific things for you. But the other couple that are more, um, local, they actually don't advertise that they'll do that, but she's, Stephanie's wonderful um, at Maple Leaf and she'll be willing to do that as well to you. So to look at this one more time, so this is what you're looking for. And again, that non-irritated down at the bottom, that's gonna provide you with that information. And I've not seen one that didn't have it on the front of it. So they're very open about, and this picture I actually got off of Simply Organic. So this is what theirs is gonna look like. And the one at Maple Leaf that I actually went and bought it has that non-irritated down at the bottom, but it's actually, I think, just by itself. So that way you'll have it a little bit separate. So does anybody have any questions about spices or storage or anything else that you wanna do? No? <laughs> Let's get cooking, there you go. Okay, well thank you guys so much for coming. I really appreciate it. And like I said, I'll get you those handouts and then if you end up having any other questions that you forgot about, just let me know.